We're now live. This week on the Virtual Skeptics. Let's see here. Bob gets emotive. He very nearly defends Kirk Cameron. Barb is afraid of Sanjay Gupta. His brain is falling. I don't know what you can do. I'm your host, Brian Gregory. I'm afraid of Sanjay Gupta as well. He's a scary individual. Hi, this is Virtual Skeptics. Don't let the music fade out. Go away. Go away, music. And I'm um, going to do his thing. And you're here. And thanks. Hi. And um, there's people here. And I'm going to talk about them. Uh, first up, we have Bob Laskowitz, CSI is conspiracy guy, web columnist, blogger for Skeptical Humanities, and Swift blog contributor, Eve Siebert, editor and blogger at Skeptical Humanities and contributor to Skepticality and Insight at Skeptic.com. Uh, that's not Barbara. That's Barbara. Barbara Dresser, former psychology instructor, blogger at ICBS Everywhere, and contributor to numerous skeptical, numerous skeptical projects, including Insights at, is it Insight or Insights? It's Insights. insights. At Skeptic.com and the odds must be crazy. And finally, Tim Farley, blogger at Skeptools and Insights. No, S. Skeptic.com. Uh, skeptic. Insight. No S. Shh. Skepticality contributor, creator, of what's the harm, and former JRF fellow. That's all. Everybody, everybody, say hi. 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 Is anybody watching? I don't think anybody's watching. But anyway, hi. Anyway, uh, we've got a few things we're gonna do. First up, I want to remind everyone because I didn't do this last week that if you are watching and you know and you have something to say and you think we'll either find it funny. Or you have a question, because, you know, questions are more important, really. Uh, you can post it on Twitter with hashtag virtual skeptic. Skeptics. That yes. 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 And um, That's two, actually. Yes. Two it's virtual skeptics. Yes, it's two S's. Um, or you can, um, what else can you do? You can put a Q&A on the Q&A on Google+. Or you can post it in the comments uh, at on the YouTube feed. And we will um, try to pay attention as best we can because we, we, you know, get a little silly. Um, but if we see it and we like it, we'll ask, answer your question or repeat your funny thing because we like funny things. So let's get this party started. Uh, Tim, you got a trivia question this week? Uh, I do. I wrote it moments ago. Probably <laughs> moments easy. ago. Tomorrow. Today is Deepak Chopra's birthday, but tomorrow <laughs> is October 23rd, unless I miss my guess. Um, what is the significance of the date, October 23rd, 4004 B.C.? <laughs> uh, that was almost exactly 6,018 years ago. <laughs> About Other than that. What is the skeptical significance of October 23rd, 4004 BC? And I'm kind of looking for a name if you really want to. Really that was right. the date the Earth was created. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. No? Okay. You're not allowed there to you go. That's well, that was good. Yay! And I hope someone gets it. Someone gets it. You going to tweet that? Awesome. The secondary quiz, as we do every week, because, you know, it's so awesome that everyone answers this so easily. Um, cause I got two videos behind me, and if you can name what they are, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, they are of uh, this week. Um, in order to get it correct, you have to name them both and name which monitor it's on, right or left, or it doesn't count. Just being very specific. Specific. Yes. So there you go. That's our stuff. Um, um, okay, then, there you go. Up first this week, Bob is not getting emotional. He's getting emotive, mm -hmm. which, so, um, which it's got to have to include a rant because it's Bob. No, 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 no. Actually, today I'm, I'm, I'm going to be kind of chill. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so today, um, well, this man, if you, if you'll bring him up, uh, uh, Mas Masaru uh, emoji. Oh wait a minute. I'm sorry. 
Sorry, not, not emoji. Not emoji. Uh, this guy, funny. Masaru Emoto. Yes, that was the worst joke ever. Um, Masaru Emoto, who, who called himself the messenger of water, um, he's dead now. He, <laughs> he died on October uh, 17th at the age of 71. He was from Yokohama, Japan, um, and he believed that water reacted physically to human emotions. And you could see this when it when it froze. So this this bit of of ice here, this ice crystal, uh, would have been formed under conditions. You bring it up. Uh, oh, that ice crystal. That ice crystal. I thought you were uh, going to show something to the camera. I was kind of a little no, scared. No, 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 no. So this ice this ice crystal here. Uh, would have been formed under conditions of love and kindness and forgiveness and happiness. So that that's a, that's a smiley one. Um, this one, the next one, uh, was frozen after exposure to negative thoughts. And you can see that it's not sim symmetrical mm. and it therefore uh, was was formed in in a, a sad or possibly hostile environment. And this, this last one, is <laughs> iconic ice that will kill you. Wow, I love that episode. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so yeah. Um, all right. So basically, he's saying that the uh, structure of the ice uh, crystals formed, uh, in if you bring up the next one, in these two jars here, uh, would be different. So you can see that this. Uh, it's uh, thank you, I love you. That the ice that forms in there will have one structure. It'll be symmetrical. It'll be aesthetically pleasing. I hate you, you fool. Will be less symmetrical and. Less pleasing. How did they freeze it while they were? I mean, was it just your thinking thoughts or? Yes, it it, it uh, is. You know, it's kind of. Like, doesn't matter. Yeah, well, you know, water. We'll get to the formulation, the scientific formulation that he uses in order to back this titanic load of monkey bollocks. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, you know, basically, what he said that they're predictably different under a microscope. Um, and it's associated with human emotions. So what he wants it to promote is world peace. Also, he believed um, that, dang, that's an attractive kitty cat. I'm just saying it. Did he believe so, that too? What is it? Uh -huh. the ice? No, that's just the kitty cat that Eve has right now. I will put the kitty cat on the screen. There you go. Yeah, and he's cat. falling asleep and he's having a oh. happy. So, okay. yeah. Um, so back to the dead guy. The emo um, yeah, emo ice. <laughs> That's good. So, like, um, he has a couple of pseudoscientific notions. Uh, he, he believes that he can purify water through prayer and giving it kind thoughts and just putting it out there into the world. Uh, he uh, started, yeah, and, and Tim's showing jazz hands. <laughs> and um, uh, he. He started doing this and talking about the, the feelings of water uh, in the early 90s, um, and he was uh, embraced by uh, other people who may not be so reputable, like Jay Z Knight and Ramtha. Uh, he was uh, he featured heavily um, in uh, What the Bleep Do We Know, uh, in which Marley Matlin and Armin Shimmerman humiliated themselves. Anyway, um, so if you want to go to the, just take a look at his uh, uh, the next the next slide. Okay. This is okay. If this water, no, if this is this is science. So if water equals me and equals life, it's it's it, it's it's math and it's logic. Then peace of water equals peaceful water. Peaceful me and peace, peaceful life. This was taken from his website. He didn't quite complete the equation. Then peace of water equals peaceful water, peaceful me, peaceful life equals bullshit. All right. So, like it, it just doesn't happen. Just, yeah, you can go to the other one. The other one is is really interesting. After the Fukushima uh, disaster, um, he was really worried. Okay, yeah, ten thousand people were still missing, but pff, he was uh, worried what? about the water. He was worried about the water at the Fukushima plant, right, um, a, a after the t tsunami. Um, and so his idea was, okay, he, he's trying to truly understand E equals mc squared, the uh, energy mass equivalence equation, right? 
Um, the energy formula, formula of Albert Einstein equals mc squared really means that energy equals the number of people and the square of the people's consciousness. These words in that order mean nothing. That's, that's like, have you ever seen Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about the questions in science and how um, you can't really answer the question, what's the square root of meatloaf? <laughs> well, you can't. Mind yeah. blown. You, you, you can if you really like meatloaf. Oh. Oh, the square root of meatloaf is meatballs. Ah, sweet, uh, Swedish meatballs? This is so an IP gone. reference. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what he, the, the, he wanted to do is get people all over uh, the planet to send thoughts of, of love and gratitude to the water in the nuclear plants of Fukushima. Um, and this is the chant that you're supposed to say. Uh, the water of Fukushima nuclear plant, we're sorry to make you suffer. Please Aww. forgive us. We thank you and we love you. Oh, oh, hold it. Is, is the water really suffering? I think the water's having fun. Maybe. Is it you know, rushing around? It's it's free. It's boiling. It's changing states. I mean, it, does the water care about us? The I don't, water doesn't give the tiniest crap. I don't, I, I don't think the water even knows we exist. Okay, my I feeling is that water sad now by saying that. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Honestly, <laughs> oh, no. the water. The this water is fall in one the of our here. most loyal viewers, I'll have you know. Water? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, this water is is scared. That's what this water is. All it's, right? Is it because it on, it's on screen? Is it scared of... No, it's not shy. <laughs> it's scared for its continued existence. Oh. Uh. It's, it, hmm. The water doesn't cease to Now exist. we have to freeze him. Yeah, the water's still there. It's just not in the glass anymore. I don't want to think but about I understand it why it's scared. Yeah, well, yeah. Because now it's looking at my gut. <laughs> That's a great image right there. Yes. Thank you for <laughs> yeah, that. Thanks for that. All right, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, Masaru Emoto, dead at 71. <laughs> All the water is sad. Sad, sad water. Sad water. No, I'm going to be thinking about that all night. Sad water. Poor sad water. Does does the water get depressed if I'm depressed about it being sad? Yes. It well, it it, it will it, change structurally it, based on your sadness. And this he seems to think of himself as circle. being. I know. Is yeah. it, this is a recursive? Or, uh, it's yeah. Um, it, it at least got a circular dependency in there somewhere. Right. Yeah, it, don't well, drink part, the sad wait, water. Can you can you really separate the dancer from the dance? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so. Nice reference. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks for the um, sad water and making us all depressed again, Bob. Um, let's see. Up next, something a little more entertaining. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> less depressing. That's what he meant. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't bet so, on it. I have sad water now. That's sad. <laughs> so, it, it, wow. at least it'll not include Bob being on screen. Um, uh, well, that, uh, I, I can handle that. That's fine. Okay. Uh, he's going to talk about. Uh, I don't know. Some about bananas, maybe. I don't. I don't understand what this topic is. Well, fruit may be involved. Fruit. Gourds, whatever. Gourds. Renowned Gourds. intellectual. Kirk Cameron, if you could bring up the first slide. <laughs> you are so going for low fruit here. That's a great picture. He, he is One promoting a new film, a new film called Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas. <laughs> One of the first volleys in this year's War on Christmas. Wow. Unquote, debunks the idea that Christmas originated as a pagan festival. Oh, sweet the film apparently provides Christian biblical explanations for Santa. Fair enough. Not biblical, but Christian. Fair enough. The Christmas tree and presents. Uh, now, Cameron and I have different definitions of saving Christmas. I've started to look forward to the holiday now with dread. But, hey, it's not just Christmas. In a recent interview with The Christian Post... 
Cameron offered advice on how to ruin, sorry, save Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> He says Christians should celebrate. Now, of course, I, there are there is a contingent of Christians who are against Halloween rabidly and have things like Hell House. But so he's for Halloween. Uh, he said Christians should celebrate it because it's a Christian holy day. The real origins, he says, have a lot to do with All Saints Day and All Hallows Eve. Right. If you go back to old church calendars, especially Catholic calendars, they recognize the holy day, the holy sorry holiday. I like the All holy Saints day. day. <laughs> yeah, oh, with no. All Hallows Eve the day before, when they would remember the dead. That's all tied into Halloween. When did they start I'd egging like people's to... houses? <laughs> yeah. It's about 5 p.m. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to pause a moment and savor an unusual experience. Kirk Cameron is mostly right. I mean, the phrase real origins is questionable, but most of that's true, even if it's sort of ridiculously obvious that Halloween has a lot to do with All Hallows' Eve. <laughs> really? It's like it's what the word means. <laughs> um, so if only he had clamped his jaw shut right after that, it, it would be, as I said, mostly correct. But no. He continued right. and continued. He says the practice of wearing costumes comes from the habit of early Christians who would dress up as, quote, the devil, ghost, goblins, and witches, precisely to make the point that those things were defeated and overthrown by the resurrected Jesus Christ. The costumes wow. poke fun at the fact that the devil and other evils were publicly humiliated by Christ at his resurrection. He continues, wow. over time you get some pagans who want to go, this is our day, a uh, high holy day of satanic church. That this is all about death. But Christians have always known since the first century that death was defeated, that the grave was overwhelmed, that ghosts, goblins, devils are foolish has beens who used to be in power but not anymore. Is he That's trying to pick a fight with the devil? I don't know. Well, That's I, the I just like the Christian irony have. that he's mad that pagans are stealing a holiday from the Christians. <laughs> yes. yes. Do you not understand yes. the yeah. irony of getting mad about that? Yes. We'll get to that. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to... <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it's an episode as jumping an ahead. <laughs> as an illustration, he mentions Obama Halloween masks. When you go out on Halloween and see all people dressed in costumes and see someone in a great big bobblehead Obama costume with great big ears and an Obama face, are they honoring him or poking fun? They're poking fun at him. So he huh. says that Christians, yeah, just yeah. Does that make him the Antichrist? That. That's the implication, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He says Christians should have the best Halloween parties on the block. Quote: You should have the reason for everyone to come to your house and before anyone else's house because yours is the most fun. Halloween gives you a great opportunity to show how Christians celebrate the day that death was defeated. And you can give them gospel tracts and tell the story of how every ghost, goblin, yes, witch and demon oh. was trounced the day Jesus rose from the grave. Clearly no Christian ought to be glorifying death because death was defeated. And that was the point of All Hallows' Eve. <laughs> wow! That does sound like fun. <laughs> <laughs> or I can just eat candy. Uh, I know! <laughs> So oh anyway, God, that's like worse than getting toothbrushes when you go around. Here, I think I'd rather have an brain. apple with a razor blade in it. Here, have a copy uh, of the Wolf Here's Tower. Some shit. Oh yeah, I know, I know. Uh, okay, so Cameron's an idiot. We know that. We've yeah. seen him gazing worshipfully, worshipfully at his partner Ray Comfort while banana. the latter fondled a banana. There's oh, a slide of this. Go. Thank you. Oh, there's a. No, that's the movie. 
That's yeah. so it's oh, yeah. Well, I yeah. want to see that. Yeah, one. there's this movie. Which yeah, that doesn't even and look like then him. the next one. So uh, like Will Wheaton, which is embarrassing, actually. And then yeah. there you go. There's the banana. <sighs> Yeah, there's a bit out. Never forget <laughs> like the expression on their face at that moment. <laughs> he, he thinks <laughs> that if it were true, must result in chimeras like the fabled crocoduck. There's a slide of that. Yay! What a dipshit. Though I imagine his mind would be blown by the crocoduck billed platypus. Another slide. Uh, which actually <laughs> came out of the former J. Ruff. That's so cute. Which it's is just stuffed platypus. platypus. Yeah. That's a croco stuffed pellet platypus. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. croc of something. <laughs> <laughs> but while he may be ignorant and his comparison of the devil and bobblehead Obama is kind of repugnant, although possibly he didn't mean it quite the way it sounded. The articles to be fair, he's an idiot, him. right? Yeah. To be fair, he's an idiot. But the articles making fun of him in Raw Story, Politicus USA, Jezebel, and other outlets are also bothersome. They all basically say, idiot, Halloween is totally just the Celtic festival of Samhain. Or as I always hear it in my head, Samhain. Uh, Raw Story says, for instance, histori historians universally recognize Halloween's origins as dating back to the Celtic festival of Samhain. And then as a source, they link to the History Channel. Oh, nice! <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. The ones that produce the Vikings, right? <laughs> and the yeah. ancient aliens. <laughs> yes. Jezebel's title is Kirk Cameron will have you know that Halloween is a Christian holiday, which mocks the very idea that the eve of All Saints Day is a Christian holiday. Guess what? It is, though. Um, <laughs> it, it certainly may have been influenced by the eve of Samhain, although that's, it's not universally agreed by historians that that's the case. But it, it may well have been influenced by the Celtic festival and other pagan festivals that mark the transition from summer to winter, a liminal time. But so what? Um, cultures incorporate elements from other cultures all the time. I, and it's not as if it's not acknowledged by uh, Christian scholars or, or scholars of uh, Christian history. That doesn't mean that Hallowtide, which includes all Saints Eve, All Saints and All Souls. It doesn't mean that that originated merely as sow and tarted up in Christian frills, or that it didn't develop organically from a long history of care and concern for the dead within the Christian church, which is, after all, a fairly common trait in humans to be concerned with the dead, how they're disposed of, and for, for many, many humans for over a long period of time, what happens to them afterwards. So the history of the Triduum, which is a religious observance lasting three days, uh, the Triduum of Hallowtide is long and complicated, and I don't have time to go into it here. Um, I may write more about it elsewhere. Briefly, though, originally you had saints' days, days commemorating individual saints, particularly martyrs in the very early church. And we still do have individual saints' days, lots of them. But after a while, there were so many saints and martyrs that the, there were too many for each to be in, celebrated individually. So the tradition developed of setting aside a day to commemorate all saints. Like and all, all saints' day actually... Like, sorry? Like President's Day. Basically. Yes. Except, except all saints' day commemorates all saints known and unknown. We don't have that with <laughs> President's nice. Day. Well, I mean, future so it includes nameless be people included, mm -hmm. I guess. It be presidents could to come, I suppose, but this includes nameless people who are not necessarily recognized by the church, but presumably recognized by God. Religious communities also kept lists of their own dead um, of the monastery and would pray for them, and then later they also kept lists or churches kept lists of the surrounding lay community and prayed for them. And then again, eventually there arose the practice of a day set aside to pray for also souls, again, known and unknown. Um, 
So that's Tim's a ridiculously Dogen. brief summary. Disagreeing with you, <laughs> maybe. Oh. <laughs> Well, having a hard time finding a spot on the couch he liked. <sighs> so that's a ridiculously brief summary, but I do want to remind skeptics and atheists that it's fine and indeed proper to make fun of Kirk Cameron, and uh, I encourage you to do it, for his reasonable errors, but try to avoid making your own mistakes when you do it. <laughs> and well, that's well, all I've got. As I like to say, don't be Kirk Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't be the banana. Don't That's be, excellent advice. Yes, don't, don't be, be Kirk, Kirk Cameron. Cameron. Yes. Thank you, Eve, for that entertaining little story thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, next. 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 Uh, next up is uh, Barb is going to uh, talk about uh, the topic of the month or the of the last like three months or I don't know how long are we talking about Ebola. I don't know. I checked last <sighs> week. We talked about Ebola last week. That was yeah. Fun. Yeah, but, but, uh, um, yeah. But there's a new video. Uh, uh, some Jay Gupta put a video out, and um, I'm curious what you thought of it. Um, well, you know, there's a lot of talk about Ebola lately, and there's some panic. Um, some of the panic is, it, it, there's even some talk about the panic being overblown in the media, which I, th I think is kind of interesting. Um, some of the panic is due to ignorance, because people don't know, you know, about Ebola. Ebola. Some of it is due to outright hope. Ebola is for that matter. They're pretty scary. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it's due to incompetence of the mainstream media, and that's really what I want to talk about. That's what I think of Sanjay Gupta. So, um, I think there's, a uh, there There's is. a slide. Um, he up, uh, CNN uploaded a video called CNN Dr. Sanjay Gupta Suits Up in Ebola Protective Gear. <laughs> That's hot. Yeah. Now, what, how am I supposed to feel about that? Uh, <laughs> I understand that hot. Hot, hot yeah. is it does hot. get very hot after a while. Yes. I, I saw the video when it was shared by science blogger Abby Smith. Um, she writes Irv, for those of you not familiar. Okay. Um, she's she studies viruses herself. She's a postdoc at Emory. Um, she works cool. in a level three facility. And Abby's response was like um, an avid football fan yelling at the TV when a player on her team runs the wrong <laughs> way with the ball. Wow. <laughs> wow! Yeah, she was like, no! No, Sanjay, no! So is he missing? Ooh. Hmm? Is he that what? could be a real problem. What? If people use that to teach... Oh, yeah, I don't think anybody's using this to teach anybody Holy how to crap. deal with this. Um, <laughs> but I watched the video, and he opens the piece with, um, so I want to give you an idea of what the CDC is recommending in terms of how to protect yourself with this personal protective gear. So why the general public needs a video on how to protect themselves from Ebola with per personal protective gear, I have no idea. Because it generates um, hits? Yeah. Uh, but he reiterates a few seconds later, where he's saying, we're following CDC protocol. Um, he dons two pairs of gloves, but it's hard to tell why. Because both of them end at the wrist, uh, over the sleeves, at the same place. So I, I don't see the, how they're functioning as less than one glove, or more than one glove. Um, he is wearing what looks like, he's not wearing what looks like a, 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 the right gown. It looks like a permeable paper gown. Um, they're supposed to wear, you know, water-resistant gowns. Um, it's open in the back, like wide open. That's uh, he's, he's wearing an N5 respirator uh, and a face shield, a but job. he's not wearing anything over his head. He's not covering his neck. And this is what he looks like. Second slide. Oh, so he does have a blast shield. Uh, he does have a face shield, and he is wearing the right respirator. It looks like the right respirator anyway. But he doesn't have anything over his head. Right. Um, uh. He says nothing about the exposed areas. Um, he doesn't. Uh, I, I actually think that these guys. Next slide did a better job. <laughs> <laughs> See, look on Pen Je Jesse's face. That's yeah. the look on uh, Barb's face right now. There you go, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> they they at least had hoods, you know. Um, and then he says that he's demonstrating how to remove the gear. And he uses chocolate sauce 
to represent contamination. Chocolate sauce. Um, I think there's Best a slide for that. Contamination oh, ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then he says you're supposed to pull the whole thing off at once. What? Like like a stripper? Both gloves and all. So you got to watch the video because he literally grabs the thing in the front and yes, he rips it off like a stripper. He just yanks it off in the process. And and in the process he contaminates his arm with the chocolate sauce. Um, and then he sticks his bare hand under a glove to get it off, and that, that's next the slide. Dip shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, he sticks his fingers under the glove to get the glove off. CDC protocol, my ass. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's so hard How are you to get to the CDC, <laughs> you know, because they're all the way three blocks away from his office <laughs> at Embry. <laughs> it's so well, hard to drive up Clifton Road. Traffic in Atlanta does suck. Up. It's true. Was there yeah. an inch of snow? It could take years. Because <laughs> <laughs> he literally, you know, for folks who aren't familiar with Atlanta, when he's not on TV... He is a neurosurgeon at Emory Hospital. He's at Emory? Yes. <laughs> and he's oh, right next to the CDC. That makes this even better that he's at Emory wait, because... Wait. Did I'm they pretty sure it? that's right. I'll check it. It, it is. I, I just checked too because I was like, he's at Emory too. You know, the, the hospital where they've successfully yeah. treated Ebola patients. Yes, yes. Right. and, and, and this, is, this is so funny because, okay... Abby's lab wanted to make a video showing how they do it. Abby works at Emory. Okay, she does not. She doesn't work in. She works in a. She does research. She does um, research on on uh, viruses. So they do things a little differently. But um, they weren't allowed. They weren't allowed to because liability, and you can guess why. Um, but she found two videos that demonstrate the proper way to suit up for Ebola patient care. One of them was um, done by CBS. Okay. And one was done by Emory. So, the, the I, I don't have. Uh, and did Sanjay them. not watch either of them? I, I, I have no idea. I I we don't have pictures of the Emory one because um I had to uh, agree to their terms and everything before I could even watch it. But Abby has a uh, blog post up, so there's we have a link. Okay. Uh, that has links to those videos, so you can actually watch those videos. Uh, watch the videos for from Emory. But the one, um, the CBS video, which we also have a link to, is anybody can watch that. And um, you can see they're much, much, much more likely to minimize exposure. Um, the CBS video also claims to be following CDC recommendations, but they do it a little differently. And <laughs> this one's run by a guy who um, is the director for the Center for Disaster Medicine at New York, uh, New York Medical College. So I'm going to trust him a little more. And um, and then there's there's this next slide. That's what that looks like. You'll notice. Um, he looks a little confused. Uh, it's, yeah, I got him in a bad <laughs> facial expression, but he sounded very competent. He talks oh. about the need to have an assistant help don yeah, the gear yeah. and so forth. You notice the head's covered. Yeah. He um they, he is wearing two pairs of gloves. One glove, one pair is underneath the right. gown. The other yeah. one is over the top. Abby says they gloves. actually wear. Yeah, they actually wear three gloves. Um, the one in the Emory video, they tape down. They only wear two, but they tape the the inner glove down yeah. to uh, the outside of the gown. Right. Um, yeah. And then the outer glove is. Um, and if the uh, if they're contaminated at all, they get rid of the outer glove and they put on a new one. And they're constantly sanitizing their hands in the um, the Emory video. The Emory video, they don a whole head gear thing that drapes down over their shoulders. In this CBS video, um, he actually talks about the exposed areas. He talks about that being a problem. He talks about how the CDC is um, advocating for um, uh, a more uh, something that covers the body more. And actually, the next video you can see what they are advocating, or the next slide rather. Jesse Bingman. Looks a little more like yeah. Looks a little more like uh, Breaking Bad there. Um, and, and that's that's what the CDC is is pushing for, but um, you know it's interesting because I, 
I can tell you that it's highly unlikely. If you watch the Emory videos, which are very detailed, they, they go step by step. They must be their training videos, um, what they're doing. Um, it's highly unlikely that anybody would be contaminated uh, if they follow those protocols um, in dealing with patients. And this is the, these were specifically for patient care. Um, and you know what? They've, Emory's dealt with Ebola without anyone else getting infected. And I wanted to also note that it's very clear that the reason those two nurses who cared for Thomas Duncan contracted the disease is not because the CDC protocols failed. It's because they didn't follow any. Um, there's, there are reports from um, the National Nurses Association about exactly what happened. They were not prepared for it. And it's actually very surprising that more of those, those healthcare workers are not sick because they didn't even isolate him for quite some time. And he was very, wow. very ill when he came in because he had already been to the hospital once. Um, when and he was sick. Yeah, when he was, when he was mm. probably when he wasn't as contagious. And, and we, we all know that from all the reports in the media that um, people are most, contagi are most contagious when they're showing uh, a lot of symptoms. And yeah. He was very, very sick when he arrived there. And they didn't isolate him. They didn't use protective gear for, for some time before somebody stepped in and said, hey, we need to get this under control. So um, that's why we have more cases of Ebola here. Uh, that's why those healthcare workers contracted it, not because CDC protocols failed. I swear, it seemed like Sanjay Gupta, Sanjay Gupta's video starts with him saying, well, I'm going to show you what they do. And then it sort of ends in a way that makes you think that he was trying to demonstrate that the CDC protocols are bad. I don't think he knew what the protocols were because he didn't seem to follow them. Here's the bad protocols that got those nurses sick. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to show you how he's actually profit off his hands. Yeah. When yeah. He's actually demonstrating <laughs> how, yeah. He's demonstrating how, get how, how problematic it can be when you don't follow them, is what it is. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. It's pretty bad. bad. But I found, I found the whole thing really interesting, um, especially with all the, the finger pointing and. Um, Finger licking. Yeah, and all the all the worry that the protocols weren't enough, and it's clear that some people are are simply not prepared for infectious disease, and and that's a problem, whether or not we have Ebola. You know, you know who knows when when they'll have to deal with somebody that has something really bad. You know, Angie Matka is that or Matki? Uh -huh. Matka. Uh, uh, she was. Uh, talking about, she's an emergency room doctor, and uh, she was talking about how does it, it, it was entirely possible, given the demands on a, a typical emergency room, that somebody might show with signs of Ebola, might mm -hmm. have the travel history that indicated, you know, maybe you should take care of this guy in a special way, right, um, and uh, still miss it. Um, the, it, it yeah, the reason he was he was sent home the first time. It, it's also entirely possible that he. It, it's kind of interesting that he didn't volunteer where he was from, right. um, you know, where he had traveled from, because that, you know, maybe there's a little bit of denial there. But but the reason they didn't ask, well, I don't know how how common it is for them to ask. Yeah, the number of demands on on doctors, especially ER docs. The number of, of the, the amount of bureaucracy they have to deal with is insane. Mm -hmm. and, there, and there's uh, so many simple ways you could just make a mistake. Like if you don't word the question of where you came from correctly and say, you know, like if it's in an airport situation and you say, well, where did you come from today? Well, mm -hmm. most people coming from Africa will have been flying in from Frankfurt or London or, yeah. you know, because there aren't direct flights to those countries. Yeah. There's also the fact fly that you Europe and then you fly over to, to JFK or whatever. The the symptoms of Ebola look like flu because you yeah. Know. yeah. And and what's more common? I mean, what what's more likely yeah. that somebody's going to walk into your That's hospital just, in Dallas? Exactly. That's typical. Yeah, and, and that they're going to have a bad flu. Yeah, I mean, we jump to the rare. But, then, but they, they they clearly didn't think it was flu because they gave them antibiotics. Well, yeah, that's a problem too. <laughs> No. It's a whole different problem. Yeah, probably. Next yeah. week on Virtual Skeptics, overuse of antibiotics. Yes. Can antibiotics treat Ebola? Dr. Sanjay Gupta explores. <laughs> 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 
Oh, God. Wow, yeah. yeah. that would be... Okay. <laughs> so, so, um... So that's depressing. Yes. Mm. That was that was another really uplifting theory <laughs> story. By the way, don't play with chocolate syrup. The death um, of Ebola and Kirk Cameron so far. It's really, yes. it's a real Abby laugh Abby. fast tonight. So I'm Abby hoping. Abby what she did, thinks you the the chocolate syrup. did you see the giant microbes? Has sold out of their <laughs> Ebola. Yeah, the the plush uh. boy microbes can't keep their Ebola stuff. Uh. <laughs> That's actually <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Oh, capitalism. People are dying to get Ebola. You can't commodify. Dying to get a stuffed Ebola, yeah. Well, Christmas is coming. Yeah, that's true. And there's a lot of people with stuff. Give your friends Ebola. Apparently. Here, I got you Ebola. Um, okay, Tim's next. I put him up on the screen, and hopefully he's going to teach us something that's going to make us feel better. Uh, yeah, mine has no death or anything in it. Just uh, <laughs> internet stuff. Um, I uh, sort of didn't have a topic, and then I realized I'm working on a blog post for Insight that will run probably in a week or two, um, as soon as I get all the footnotes and everything done on it. But um, So I can talk about that. So this is a sneak preview of my post that will be, uh, it might not even be my next post on Insight, but it will probably run the first week of November, and you'll find out <laughs> why in a second. But if you go to my first slide, I'm going to talk about one of those memes, right? You, you, you've, you've all seen this quote. It pays to keep an open mind, but not so open your brains fall out. And a lot of people attribute it to Carl Sagan. I've never seen that attributed to him. Oh, yeah? Who do yeah. you usually see it attributed to? I don't usually see it attributed to anyone, actually. Was oh, okay. it an astrophysicist? Huh? Oh, God. He gives credit to whoever oh, it is. Feynman? Feynman, maybe. Yeah, I don't, no. I don't think it's Feynman, um, but he. But Sagan uh, says it, it's at the end of the chapter, "The Dragon in My Garage." Oh. And he, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that yeah, I've got it right here. It's on page one eighty seven. Look at that. I was about to say one eighty seven, but you people know I wasn't. And um, I don't remember that. The actual quote, at least in this version, in the Demon Haunted World version, is keeping an open mind is a virtue. But as space engineer James Oberg once said, not so open that your brains fall out, right? So even Sagan admits that it's not his quote, right? Right here in the book. Now, I got interested a long time ago. Uh, I, you know, I do this skeptic history thing, and if you go to the next slide, I've got Oberg's version. And, um, and this one isn't even spelled right. Uh, I got this off of... I don't know where, meatville.com. Um, no, so there's all different versions of this thing. No, you know, so. And there's people, there are, there are some that are written more like admonitions. I like the one that says keep an open mind, where it's telling you, here, do this, but don't do that, because it's sort of nice. You like giving orders, advice. don't you? Um, yes. Now, I have sort of had a little file off to one side where I've been researching this because I had this idea that, you know, maybe someday I'll figure out who actually originally said this, and it might turn into a skeptic history because if they said it in a speech, then there's a date for it. Um, and I've been digging, and, and um, there's a lot of good resources for that, and I'm going to have some stuff in the blog post about how you dig this stuff up. Um, the reason that I got interested in it was one of our trivia questions a few weeks back, I think, was about uh, the word bunkum. Remember yep. that, that one? Mm -hmm. um, because that word actually has a birthday, which is February 25th, 1820, I think. Mm -hmm. And it has yeah. to do with a speech, and you can go back and do that I episode. the glory again. Um and so um, one of the things that I've been using to research this is Google Books because Google's been doing this thing since um, uh, 2005 where they're trying to basically scan in every book they can lay their hands on and they've been cooperating with libraries and stuff. And they have so a lot of the books, especially the ones that are out of copyright, you can actually see the pages of. The other ones you can search in so you can find out, oh, this piece of text is in this book and then maybe go to the library and get it or go buy a copy. Um, so you can find things that you would never be able to find before, you know, like a random quote on page 900 of some book. And then sort it chronologically. It's lovely. 
Yeah, the 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 the, the chronological information comes in handy when you start using this thing called n-grams, and I think that's my next slide. If you go forward one, here is an n-gram search for bunkum and debunk, and we know bunkum came from 1820. And sure enough, if you look in n-grams, bunkum just starts appearing in books around 1837 or so, um, and which is what you would expect. It was a colloquial phrase that people were using. It wouldn't appear in books until a little bit later, and then it grows through the 19th century and hits a peak early in the 20th century, and then kind of drops off. And then around 1920 see the word debunk appear. And that has a source, not an actual date. It comes from a novel where somebody took the word bunkum and derived debunk from it. And it actually dates from 1923. So this graph um, pretty well agrees with what we know about the roots of these words. So that's an interesting thing you can do with Google Books and Google Ngrams. So I looked at um, the phrases, you know, brains fall out and open mind and things like that. Now, you can't type that entire phrase in because, of course, it's worded different ways and, you know, whatnot. But you can type individual subphrases in. So if you go to the next slide, here is fall out, falls out, because some people say brain falls out, some people say brains fall out, and open mind. And you can see that these phrases are, are also relatively recent in terms of being commonly used in books and things. Um, so this would tend to indicate that this quote is probably originated, you know, maybe in the late 19th century, more likely in the 20th century. So it's, a, it's probably now, a pretty recent quote. Which now, is, huh? fallout is also an expression that, that means uh, to faint or pass out. Falleth out. Yeah. So I'm wondering uh, if yeah, this isn't necessarily right. uses that have anything to do. I'm just saying that you know, in terms of people using the word fall followed by the word out in books, this is the data that Google has, and it can be inaccurate. Like if you search for the word internet, you'll find <laughs> you'll yeah, find references find that go references. way back. Yeah. A lot of it is bad OCR, and a lot of it is bad um, metadata on books, where they have incorrectly indicated the publishing date of a book. Um, and, and they get better and better at that. So it's not perfect, but it does give us an idea that this quote maybe is probably a relatively recent, last hundred years or so, invention, and not like some ancient proverb that, you know, George Washington uh, came up with or whatever. So I started Googling around some more on Google Books, and there were some other people who had looked into this. There was an article in Skeptic Magazine in 2003, and there's a website, there's a guy named Peter Olison who writes some books called Factoider that's all like uh, debunked facts, and he's involved in the Swedish skeptics, I think, because he links to their site. And both of those articles had come up with a lot of different suspects for the original uh, source of this, including Richard Feynman, science fiction author Stephen A. Callis, uh, Bertrand Russell, um, J. Robert Oppenheimer, who wrote a book called Open Mind, or The Open Mind. And uh, the, the, Richard Dawkins mentioned it in a speech, but I looked up the speech that he mentioned it in, and it was later in 1996, so he probably got it right here, because this came out early in 1996, and yeah. Dawkins' speech was in November of that year, so he probably read the book. Um, the funny one that I love that gets cited a lot, and you can actually find memes that have this, is it, it's credited to Harold T. Stone. You know who Harold T. Stone is? Mm -hmm. He was the judge on Night Court. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. I was thinking that, but... Which is entirely possible that he said that in an episode, but it hardly makes him the originator of the quote. At best, it's the, it's the writer of that episode. So, um, and one of the uh, other sources, and if you go to my next slide, is uh, this fellow, uh, Arthur Hayes Salzberger. He was, uh, his family uh, was the publishers of 
the New York Times for years and other New York based things. He was the publisher of the New York Times from 1931 to 1965. And it's pretty easy to find a speech that he gave in 1954 where he uses this quote at the bicentennial of Columbia University right there in New York City. Um, so, um, and that was pretty good, and a lot of people cite him as the source because you can find that reference. And you can find, if you have access to the New York Times archives, you can find other references and articles and uh, editorials that he wrote. Um, but it doesn't seem like the final source because you can do a search on Google Books, and what I did was actually do a search that uh, you can set the time on searches. So you can say, I'm interested in... Uh, you know, books from this time to this time. And I actually did a search on Google Books that ended before his 1954 speech. Um, and lo and behold, I found three pages of references. And the interesting thing was they were all academic, academic references. They were all like alumni quarterlies and the, the newsletters of fraternities and um, the Yale Law Review and things like that. So it's like, oh, that's interesting. So he gave this at a speech at Columbia and other things are going on in academia. So I started digging into that and uh, found this person. If you go when to do you work? No, I'm sorry. I've been doing this. This I've had this file open for like three years, so I've okay. been doing this a little bit of a time over uh, the last three years. Um, this woman uh, I had never heard of before. Her name, she has the interesting name of Virginia Gildersleeve. <laughs> and she was the uh, dean. Golden shirt and Gildersleeve. Yeah, exactly. And she... <laughs> She was a, a very interesting person who had a, a long career, and she, but she was the dean of Barnard, um, which is one of the seven sisters, the uh, seven uh, historically women's colleges in the United States that sort of get lumped together under that name. And she was the dean from 1911 to 1947. Now, if you know anything about the seven sisters or Barnard, you know Barnard is literally right across the street from Columbia University. And actually, now Barnard is part of Columbia University. Um, and so that was interesting because Salzberger gave his speech at Columbia. Here's this woman at Barnard that's being credited with it. Um, but I never could find a uh, actual reference that that had like the text of a speech or a book she wrote. And I actually wrote, I found there's a, 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 an academic who still works at Barnard who wrote a biography of Gildersleeve and I emailed her because like most college professors she has an email address that you can get off the college website. And I emailed that her. That's considered really rude. No, I'm joking. And I, and I asked her, I said, you know, here's this quote. Somebody says, this guy says, Virginia Gildersleeve says this. Uh, have you encountered this in her papers? Which, you know. And she said, you know, that's a great quote, and it kind of sounds like something Virginia Gildersleeve would say, but I have never encountered that in any of her papers. Now, she might have said it in a talk and never written it down. So that was sort of a dead end, but in the same digging where I saw people crediting her, I found uh, this guy who... Uh, I'm thinking Eve might recognize. This is a guy by the name of William Allen Nielsen. And he was the president Ooh. of Smith College. I'm he sorry, I, I didn't catch the name. Nielsen? Uh, William Allen Nielsen. He was a Scottish English professor. Hmm. Well, anyway. No, oh well. Um... He was the president of Smith College, which is another of the Seven Sisters, from 1917 to 1939, so it kind of fits our window. He also taught at Burn Mawr, another one of the Seven Sisters, and he taught at Columbia. So it's sort of this whole, you know, circle of people. Um, and I found several references, including one I later found, or someone else found, and, and there's a blog post that I'm going to end up linking to in my blog post, where Salzberger credited it to this guy. And Salzberger credited it to him in a couple of things, and then actually said, there's an article where Salzberger says, well, I used to credit this to somebody that I found it from, but now I consider it my own. 
Uh, so he just sort of adopted the 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 uh, the, the phrase. But uh, Nielsen apparently said it a few times, or at least according to these secondhand references. That led me to a thing in the Google Books Index that was in the Smith Alumni Quarterly, which I thought was going to be my payoff, right? Unfortunately, I couldn't find a library nearby that had copies of the Smith Alumni Quarterly, and I'm not a whiz at calling librarians up and doing that kind of stuff. I, I probably should be. Tim, Tim, Tim. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, I should have just called them on the phone. Uh, but someone else did. And he found that in that alumni quarterly, the same one that I was going after and just didn't have the time to make the phone call, is the answer to the question. And it's not William Allen Nielsen, but actually a close associate of William Allen Nielsen at that time, who is this next guy, if you go to this next slide. Which one? USA? The guy, yeah, his name is USA. <laughs> no, it's, USA. The, guy, it's the guy on the left, and his name is Walter Kochnig. And he was best known as a diplomat. He worked for the United Nations for years. Uh, he was Austrian-born, and but li moved to the United States. Um, and during the 30s, he was a professor at, guess what, Smith and Holyoke, which are quite near each other, um, and uh, also a seven sister. And he was on a committee with William Allen Nielsen uh, involving, I forget what it was, the International Students Committee or something like that. And he was giving a speech at Smith College with William Allen Nielsen present um, on November 8, 1939. Uh, right as World War II was launching, yeah, and it was about you know what was going on in the world and what we needed to think about it. And he used the quote, and his version of the quote, which I probably should have put on a slide, um, was, "Let us keep our minds open by all means, but don't keep your minds so open that your brains fall out." Wow. So that's as far as I've gotten. I found that the State University of New York at Albany has uh, Walter Kochnig's papers, and they have quite a lot of them, uh, including the original script for that talk, where I confirmed that it was on November 8th, 1939. Um, and uh, I hope to contact that library or send a skeptic to that library to uh, verify that the quote is there in the talk and maybe look through some of his other papers and discover whether or not uh, he used it earlier. Now, there's another quote that I think the factoider guy, Peter Olison, found um, involving a law professor by the name of Max Radin that dates from two years earlier, but it's really not quite the same quote. It uses the brains fall out, but it's more of a criticism thing. It's more of, you know, oh, those people are, are their minds are so open, their brains are falling out sort of thing, which I don't think has the same spirit as the recommendation quote. Um, yeah. It's not recommending that you have an open mind. It's criticizing someone for having a mind that's too open, um, which is sort of a different thing different meaning, but uh, he, so he got his degree, guess what, from Columbia, he got his PhD from Columbia, and uh, the that was in the Yale Review, so clearly, whether or not we have found the final answer to this question, it was definitely a phrase that was bouncing around colleges in the northeastern United States in the 1930s, and it was basically a meme of sorts at that time, not the graphic uh, internet meme, but... Where was Oberg? Where was Oberg based? Uh, Oberg was more Ohio. He, uh, I think he got his undergrad in Ohio and uh, uh, out west. So, okay. yeah, I looked at that and I thought, oh, if, if that Oberg went to Columbia, that would tie this whole thing together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Not, oh, well. not, not so much. Uh, I think he probably got it from somewhere else, from Sulzberg or whatever. But definitely, uh, it dates from the 30s. So clearly, it's not Oberg or Sagan's original, because uh, Sagan was uh, uh, four 
<laughs> when right. Cat Snake <laughs> said this, and Oberg wasn't even born yet. So, uh, wow. there you go. The, the origin, and I'll have a probably way too long blog post on Insight in a couple of weeks, and the 75th anniversary of that talk is Saturday, November 8th. Cool. I feel like I just watched an episode of Connections. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Hopefully I can make the blog post as interesting. Yeah. Except I don't have the rights to use any of those photos in a blog post, so we'll figure out something. <laughs> yeah, well... You can tell your story and then take a screenshot of the web page. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can just embed this uh, episode, I guess. No. Yeah, I've done that before. Yeah. Okay, so thanks, Tim. I guess um, I guess uh, I do this really quick because um, we're we're starting to go a little bit yeah, long, but but my, this week I got quick stuff, so I'll do this. Uh, first up, I got a little little bit of a video. Is it going? Is it going? Is it going? That's a commercial. Yay, commercial. Does this segment have a name? One, um, it's this week in the robot apocalypse. You, you know, I do this every week that I'm here. That Tim's usually not here, but <laughs> but uh, this is a video that was taken by a cell phone at New York City Comic Con. This is like uh, it was two weekends ago, I think it was, um, and it's a demonstration uh, done by a company called Megabot EPK, or actually Megabot yeah, Killbot Incorporated. This is their uh, their on um, prototype. Yeah, EPK stands for Electronic Press Kit. Ah, look at that. Well, then they misquoted it in this article. There you go. Thanks. Um, they are um, Kickstartering. Uh, Kickstartering? Is that a word? Kickstartering? I, yeah. Kickstarting. Kickstart. Well, this Kickstarter is a proper name, so it would be Kickstartering. Uh, well, okay. So, um, but yeah, they're uh, they want to build mechs um, and fight them. <laughs> really? Yes. Uh, For their, real? their plan, yeah, this plan is to, to do some kind of show based on these real walking mechs. Now, the the prototype that they brought to the show um, has a tilting or a turning head. Is actually a cockpit in there? You can see it, there's a person in there driving it, and an, an arm that's semi-articulated with a gun in it. And sitting next to it is a um, one of the like uh, weapons packs that's supposed to shoot paintballs at like 150 miles per hour. Um, it, really cool demo. Um, obviously, the easy part uh, of building a mech like this. The walking is probably the hard part, um, and then getting everything self-contained is kind of the hard part. And power. And yeah, well, it's it's hydraulic, so um, yeah, gasoline engine of some kind. Oh, all right. Um, I don't think that's going to be that big of a pro problem. But getting it to to walk and walk in a way that it actually would be not just watching paint dry kind of walking right. uh, would be the difficult problem to solve. But it's interesting. Um, the Kickstarter's not actually up yet. There's a there's like a placeholder page at, at their website. But um, if you think this is going to be something cool, then you could probably get some cool perks, maybe a ride in it or something. I don't know. Um, I thought it was cool, and I thought, um, wow, I want one. So. I, what, what, what? I don't know. Yeah, well. You don't know? So they they want to fight them? Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot of data. Are they, like killing each other? No, well, oh, no, I thought they personally wanted to fight them. Yeah. So, like the owners of the company? I don't think so. Um, yeah. The only information I could find, because the website has barely almost nothing on it, but uh, this video has uh, recordings of an announcer on the site who's talking about. The, what they're trying to do, <clears throat> and uh, and he's describing um, having some kind of show where you would have two piloted or more robots with paintball guns, and they would have they take damage, and and have some kind of combat type situation. They did not say that like somebody could just rent it and and use it, but they probably trained pilots, but so. Still. So it'd be like a Basically monster truck dangerous. rally. You like that 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 thing at the monster truck rally that crushes cars. Okay. So, but it walks. So that would be cool. I wonder if it could juggle Volkswagens. <laughs> nice. Because you know that would be awesome. 
So not really uh, too exciting as far as robotics per se, but giant mech. Okay. Um, and this next one is um, this. Um, Didn't, oh, we did this. Did we do this? We did this one already. No, we were, we, we were talking about something else and we referenced it. Okay. Yeah, this is the this is the one where you have robots that uh, try to save human lives. Wow. Um, and trying it to program like you're playing basketball me. Yeah. Yeah, this, I'm this is um, Yeah, this is a, a a better picture of the the layout or or just have these couple of these are these are commercially available test platform robots. You can just buy these things at, for a couple hundred bucks at, at a store somewhere. Um, but the idea is that one is kind of patrolling around this hole, in quotes, and trying to protect the other one from falling in, um, where it's just using simple logic, saying, okay, if something is going toward the hole, I need to get in front of it. Now, they, they, did, they expand the test to have multiple robots, and the robot got kind of um, confused so that uh, almost well, almost half the, the the trials they ran, it spent too much time trying to decide whether or not it should save one or the other, and they both end up dying, um, falling in the hole. Uh, and this, I, I mean, uh, I know that's kind of bringing this back up again, but um, there is a a really good interview published on the IEEE robotics site this week by a guy, um, Michael. Jordan, uh, Michael L. Jordan, no, I. Jordan, Michael I. Jordan. He's an IEEE fellow. He's a Pyeongchang Distinguished Professor at the University of California and is one of the most respected authorities and the observer of, of machine intelligence. Um, and he has this really good interview of, of, of questions related to um, brain, brain metaphors for AI, um, machine vision, um, big data, and whether or not that's going to equate to intelligence. Um, the singularity and other r kind of where's the state of, of machine AI right now and how sh afraid should we be in my, this is my mind saying how afraid should we should be of machines actually taking over and this is it's a really really interesting long read but um, but it's uh, it is in terms that most people understand except for a few things about PNNP which only some people can understand but um it's related to this, and in, in that, because um, uh, this was a problem. This is one of the experiments that were done trying to uh, figure out a way to teach robots to understand uh, human concepts like morality or, or like ethics and things like that. Where in this case, the robots clearly did not understand anything, and most machines do not understand anything. They just follow a set of rules that we give them. Um, and um, I just wanted to, you know, point that you guys to go read that and check it out if you're interested. Um, it uh, will reassure you that we're not going to die anytime soon. So that's that. Any okay. questions? Not us dying. That's good. I'm I'm on board with that. Yeah. I just I just don't understand if it was if it was the the algorithms that these robots here, uh, the the saving. Uh, the, the selfless robots, if they're so simple, I imagine that it, that it, as simple as it get would be objectivism, and then why would you bother saving the other robot? Never mind. I tried to make a joke, and it just freaking exploded in my face, and now I'm... I got it, but it, but, but it sounded I'm, so much like a philosophical question that I actually I bothered it. And, <laughs> it's, and that kind of ruined the laugh. Yeah. I'm yeah. ashamed <laughs> of my humor. Yeah. Well, an example of the kind of things that uh, Michael Jordan is talking about in this this article is um, one of the common things that you that comes up all the time, over and over again, um, in the context of uh, machine intelligence. Um, there have been a lot of projects lately that do really complex pattern recognition. There's the the, the, the voice recognition stuff that's pretty damn good. Um, we've got image recognition systems that, that are also getting really good. Um, and systems that can sweep, you know, I, I talked about one a few weeks back that, that, that can look through videos and, and recognize things in them. Um, facial recognition, things like this. 
But the point he makes is that this is not new technology. This is based on the same like neural network type te technology that was originally pioneered back in the 80s and actually has, was talked about as early as the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and it is nothing new and it's not intelligence. It's essentially just a complicated pattern recognition system and it's not really based on, on the brain because um, it's not a system of connections. It is, it is a, a, like a weighted pattern engine. So, yeah. So that, that's an example of the kind of stuff he talks about. And it's, it's good read, so go check it out. That's that. Arm yourself for the coming apocalypse with knowledge. And no questions. Okay, good. That's, um, that's all the stories and stuff. Next week, will Kevin marry Susan? Or will he find out about her baby? Um, we got a few wrap-up things. What was the trivia question? Did anybody get the answer, Tim? Yeah, actually, a very interesting person that we will all recognize was one of the two people who got the answer. Uh, Sharon Hill. Whoa! But she wasn't actually the very first person to get the oh. very first. Oh, out of practice, Sharon. Oh, and the answer no. was, was Pierre Cloutier on yeah. YouTube. And, uh, and the answer is uh, October twenty third, four thousand four BC, is when a fellow by the name of Bishop Usher claimed that the world was created based on literally counting the begats in the Bible and um, it backwards. And I, I'd like to point out that I did not know that's what the answer was when I stupidly blurted yeah, it out. Yeah, you like, you blurted out, it out. I was making a joke, which, you know, is now not funny which at all. Which makes it even funnier now that you think yeah. about it. 6,000 years ago. 6,000, okay. But yeah, he was not the first the one to make it, like the Anno Mundi. Did he do it in rap form? Because that would be cool. <laughs> yeah. Beget, 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 beget. Um, never mind. So, oh, the the, uh, the the videos. No one even tried. You know, it's I'm not. I'm going to stop doing this because you guys don't well, even. Well, Alex try. had one guess. That's so hard. But, yeah. That's so hard, Brian. Yeah, Alex said uh, the UFO incident, and no, it's not the UFO incident. I'm um, sorry. I actually I picked. I have to admit, uh, the, whole, the whole thing about getting the right screen this week was kind of a joke because it's the same movie. Um, <laughs> it's, it's two of what I would think recognizable scenes of one movie that I love. It's a B movie, um, and you guys could probably think about it as soon as I say it. It's, it's Repo Man. Oh. oh, my God, I would never have gotten that. No, the, the I one, have not seen that scene, It's been so long since I've seen it. Yeah, the, the one scene with the car flying around is the finale. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, and the other one is the famous scene in the um, in the grocery store where he um, um, actually, I think it, yeah, I was thinking it was the scene where they the guy gets killed and he blames society for who he is and says, "No, you're just some urban punk," which was awesome. But yeah, so sorry guys, is it so they're they just so, so blotchy you can't see them? Maybe I'll move them or something. Maybe I'll figure out something. No, it's that they're that obscure. <laughs> Repo Man is not obscure. No, but I haven't seen it. I, I mean, how old is the movie? I think I saw it a year after it came out, and that was it. <laughs> I, I saw it last week. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's sitting on my shelf. Blake would have had it, man. Yep. Just saying. Okay, so. Uh, do we have announcements? We've got one. Who wants to do it? Should we, should we sing the uh, oh, the copyrighted song? It, I don't think it's copyrighted anymore. I think That's that fine. recently resolved itself. Ah, really? Yeah. You want to sing, Bob? No? No, I, I don't think he'll appreciate the singing. Um, it is um, it is Nathan Miller's birthday. Happy birthday, Nathan. Happy birthday, Nathan. Yay. Now drink legally. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Woohoo. I put the, yeah. Okay. So uh, anything else? Any other announcements? No. Um, I'm. I, I do, in fact, have uh, an article in Skeptical Inquirer uh, this month, um, and I want to just want to say that she suffers from that that condition of like hot chick who just needs to take off her glasses and let her hair down, <laughs> and then and and not be so grumpy face, and she'd probably be good looking. 
Uh, but, I, I think you should just stop, Bob. Just yeah, stop, put yourself Bob. in the foot there. You're getting into a bad area there. Yes. Uh, <sighs> fine. <laughs> Take <laughs> my humor and shove it. You can't make up your mind? Okay, so uh, that's all for announcements? No? Okay. Um, book time. Well, let's go first. I got a show. Huh? Oh, Barb. Barbara. Okay. The buyers think that what they're buying will appreciate in value, making them rich in the future. The product grows more and more elaborate and more and more expensive, but the expense is offset by cheap credit provided by sellers who are eager to encourage buyers to buy. Buyers see that everyone else is taking on mounds of debt, and they are more comfortable when they do the when they do so themselves. Besides, for a generation, the value of what they buy has gone up steadily. What could go wrong? Everything continues smoothly until, at some point, it doesn't anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's skip. Um, um, let's Bob, go ahead and do yours. All right. Exhaustion was pressing upon and overpowering her. Goodbye, because I love you. He did not know. He did not understand. He would never understand. Perhaps Dr. Mandelette would have understood if she had seen him, but it was too late. The shore was too far behind her, was far behind her, and her strength was gone. Such an emotional reading. Oh. Yeah. Eve. For the author of the sermon is concerned only with the itinerary of the elect. The damned who go directly to hell are not discussed. He then develops an idea of great importance, the liturgical triduum of the vigil of All Saints, All Saints Day, and the commemoration of the dead corresponds to the three phases of the itinerary of the elect after death. Now, it must be said that this analogy requires a certain logical agility if it is to hold. For if Halloween, a fast day, corresponds to the first phase, separation of the body and soul, the, other, the order of the other two remaining days must be inverted if the symbolism is to make sense. It is the third day, the commemoration of the dead, that corresponds to purgatory. Tim? Bunkum. Bunkum. Oh, man. Phonetics respelling of bunkum. Informal. Talk that is empty, insincere, or merely for effect. Humbug. Humbug. What's the original spelling? Never guess my book. <laughs> the dictionary? I don't know. Uh, I lost my place. Let me find my place here. There you go. There it is. Okay. Uh, the specimen, as West repeatedly observed, had a splendid nervous system. Much was expected of it. And as a few twitching motions began to appear, I could see the feverish interest on West's face. He was ready, I think, to see proof of his increasingly strong opinion that consciousness, reason, and personality can exist independent of the brain, that man has no essential connective spirit but is merely a machine of nervous matter, each section more or less complete in itself. In one triumphant demonstration, West was about to reg relegate the mystery of life to the category of myth. I'm going to leave that there. Barb, what's your book? The Higher Education Bubble by Glenn Harlan Reynolds. Mm. Interesting. Bob? The Awakening. The Awakening. Ugh. By Kate Chopin. <laughs> Sorry. I know, I don't like it either, but it's angry water at the end. It was within arm's reach, I guess. Angry water. Eve. Birth of Purgatory by Jacques Legoff. Jacques Legoff. Jacques. So far, I've known. Uh, I, okay, fine. Tim, what's yours? Oxford or Merriam Webster? Webster's <laughs> New World <laughs> College Dictionary. It's the College Dictionary. Okay, so. Uh, mine, because it's October and I'm reading a uh, neat. October -y things. Um, I'm, I've been working my way through the complete works of H.P. Lovecraft, and uh, that particular short story is the um, Herbert West, the Reanimator from 1922. And I, I suspect the movies had something, to, uh, some kind of connection to this, because there you go. And that's that. And the show peters out. Are we done? <laughs> Painful. Punters to a stop. Can we, can we, we have a dance yet? 
Do we have any more animals to show? Um, do we, uh, any more They're off napping. Um, puns or anything? No. Um, thanks for watching. I think that's all of our stuff. And uh, we're going to put the logo up and the music. And I'm going to find my script. Where's, it? Where's my script? Ah, there it is. Virtual Skeptic is an independent production of What's the Harm.net, Step for Men, myself, ICBS Everywhere, and the list keeps going, and Doubtful News. Our logo was designed by SarahMayhew.com, and our theme music is my music and used with permission. Justice.